Um, I'll begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to address this group. It's really a pleasure, especially because I see very many familiar names in the audience. Um, for those of you, you may have seen presentations of this project along the way. I hope that there's some new material in it for you, um, and I appreciate your coming. Um, I've asked uh, Inga to share the uh, links for the slides as well, because I'll have a couple of visualizations uh, and I have a tendency to talk a bit quickly. So if you'd like to go back and take a closer look, you're more than welcome to. So early modern digital itinerary was originally a companion project to my dissertation, which focuses on the origins of pan-European postal networks. Much of the material I'll present today is actually featured in a forthcoming article in the Journal of Social History, I believe available this summer. The article was part of an NEH funded workshop based at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media. Hence, it'll also be accompanied by an open access preprint version, uh, which has been annotated with the intent of making transparent this process of developing a digital history article, and I hope will be helpful for perhaps teaching purposes down the road. Today, I'll begin by briefly introducing the nature and the construction of the M-Digit data set. I'll then talk about how I use network metrics to test and challenge existing scholarship on early modern European space. I'll discuss what this does for our periodization of early modern trade and travel. And finally, I'll end with a brief discussion about where I see this project going next. Here is in many ways the book that started it all. This is Ottavio Codogno's New Itinerary of Posts Throughout the World, which was published in 1608 in Milan. The author, Ottavio Codogno, was the postal lieutenant for the Spanish Post Office of Milan, which itself was one of the most important hubs of this network. He worked with the Tassas postmistress, uh, the Tassas being the family on whom I focused the dissertation, and who really had a postal monopoly across much of Europe for a better part of 300 years, um, going on to become Turin and Toxis. Codogno's book is well known to postal historians especially, um, and it's best known for its prose chapters, which detail the history and the day-to-day -day operations of the post, uh, written from Codogno's own firsthand experience. The system that Codogno was a part of, this Tassas built system, was in itself only about a century old at the time of his writing. And when I refer to the post here, I mean specifically way stations where couriers could pick up and distribute mail, exchange horses, um, and perhaps spend the night. His, the audience for his book notably was not um, in a select group, but rather a much broader group. Uh, so he wrote at one point that it's not just for the convenience of princes and lords, but also for the common good of all men of business. Um, this is similarly reflected on the page where he describes it as useful, not just to secretaries, but to clerics and to merchants. So clearly looking for a broad audience. In fact, Codonio's book appears to have been fairly well received. Um, it was republished in several editions, including in Venice in 1611 and 1676, um, and even shared among the Tassas postmasters themselves. So what then is an itinerary book? Well, on the left, I'm showing four examples of Codonio's different editions held at the British Library, and I'm showing it with a two pound coin for scale. So you can see immediately that these are a very small format book, usually about the size of one's palm, although quite thick with information. Their defining trait tends to be what I'm showing on the right, which is route tables. Route tables feature semi-standardized components. It's quite structured data um, to use a modern term. This includes a list of the actual locations you would pass through, and that's where we get the name itinerary from. An itinerary describes this consecutive list of cities um, and had existed as a format since ancient Rome. It also organizes this information under what I refer to as a route header, which is typically just a short description of, for example, the journey from or the post from Augsburg to Cologne, which is what we see here. It also um, features two other elements, the first one being uh, distance. Um, in this case, it's being represented as the number of postal way stations that one would pass through. Um, also, it features marginalia in many cases, which I believe further supports that these were books meant to be carried on the road and used. So we see readers marking off their own journeys or even making corrections where necessary. Overall, itinerary books arose from a wider project of cataloging and taxonomizing Europe and the world. From dictionaries to gazetteers, the early modern period was the age of the reference book, with more than 1,600 types of guides published between 1470 to 1599 alone. 
itinerary books structured European uh, conceptualization and navigation of space well through the 18th century, but they've rarely been studied as a text technology. In addition to a data set, M-Digit, as I call it for short, represents the first attempt at a comprehensive bibliography. And it importantly considers Spanish, German, French, all these itinerary traditions together um, as a way that has not been done before. Overall, I make the argument that the route canon established by these books well represents a kind of common mental map carried by early modern Europeans, especially cosmopolitan professionals. As it stands, the M-digit data set consists of the route header data, so that information provided as the posts from Augsburg to Cologne, um, from about 86 itinerary editions by 26 different authors. Overall, this is a itinerary tradition published across a broad geography and chronology. So on the right here, I'm demonstrating how representative the data set is of this total bibliography I've been able to assemble. These uh, are notably printed itinerary books that feature that standardized format of the route tables. While the data set is not a perfect sample in a statistical sense, I do think that it's generally representative of how diverse this genre was. Mapping the times and places of publication demonstrates the scale of this international knowledge project, notably undertaken prior in large part to scientific cartography. Overall, the representation here is uh, that of the data that I intend to make publicly available this summer to accompany the article, likely putting it in either a repository or GitHub, still working out the details on that. MDigit differs from projects focused on early modern road networks like Via Bundes. Rather than documenting real infrastructure, I'm seeking to reconstruct a sense of abstracted space, or a kind of route canon, as I refer to it. Itinerary books were inherited, modified, uh, sorry, itinerary books inherited, modified, and propagated relational logics. Routes were both more fixed and elastic than cartography. Centers grew and shrunk, directionalities flipped, and the margins became the core of the conceived network over time. At the same time, certain key structures remain arguably well long past their real world applicability. These are, to borrow a term from Sean Graham, um, who's written about Roman itineraries, imagined journeys. Network analysis helps to preserve the itinerary sense of hierarchy and directionality. In place of the map, network methods allow for the consideration of cities and routes as only semi-spatial. Overall, the data set offers an important point of comparison and contrast with cartography, which they predated and eventually went on to cross-pollinate with as forms of geographic knowledge organization. The sum effect of many small interventions and occasionally complete reworkings of itineraries produced new models of European space. By reading these itineraries as a collective corpus, we provide new periodization for shifts in travel and exchange networks across time, especially as this information was made accessible and had an impact on a popular conception of a connected Europe. So with those being the big questions in mind, how then do we go from these sources to constructing the data set? Uh, some of the decisions here are reflection of technical limitations. To date, MDigit has been in large part a one woman project and so hand done in many ways. The base of the data set remains these, header, um, these headers that I've referred to before. Uh, so here are the overview table that I provide. You can see that this, uh, as it appears on the page, appears as one row within this table of essentially an appearance of a given route within a given itinerary edition. However, this uh, technical limitation at first also prompted inquiries into how these route headers served as a kind of indexing structure for the books. It, it really drove me to consider this as a constructed space rather than a simple documentation of existing infrastructure. The organization of locations into selected lists um, introduced hierarchy, directionality, and centrality. So I made some structural choices in assembling my model in order to maintain those. For example, in thinking about a cross-country American trip, we'll often describe it as taking either the northern or the southern route. And it's a slightly different trip when you refer to it as a cross-country trip from DC to San Francisco via Denver, or one from San Francisco to DC via Phoenix, for example. Um, and I wanted to maintain that in the data. 
So the resulting data set distinguishes between a route, which is this abstracted sense of uh, connectedness between an origin, a destination, and sometimes intermediaries, um, and the individual edges drawn by that route, so the one-to-one -one relationships between locations. A route, on the one hand, will be Rome to Paris via Milan, and that might appear in many different editions. But then the edges themselves are Rome to Paris, Rome to Milan, and Milan to Paris. Reading across the itineraries does support that there was a common genome to the genre, even across this diverse geographic and temporal span. Itinerary creators, by which I refer to publishers as well as the named and anonymous authors, referenced, altered, and republished one another's work, uh, sometimes across quite a broad span. So here I'm representing each of the itineraries and a selection thereof of the total 86, um, as uh, labeled by the author, uh, the author's initials and the date of publication, um, with the red representing routes that are published by a single author and then blue representing routes that are published by two or more authors. And you can already see that there's a real shared uh, genome to this genre. In fact, this canon consisted of uh, several types of routes. Um, the first type is those that cross the Alps. Uh, so going from Trent to Vienna and Genoa to Lyon, for example. It included tight groups of major Italian and Dutch cities. So Milan, Genoa, Rome, Venice, and Naples on the one hand, and then Brussels, Antwerp, and Ghent on the other. And then a set of uh, Spanish routes, which were focused on the path of St. James, um, also known as the Camino de Santiago, as well as the Royal Court at Valladolid. Routes that initially appear in Giovanni del Erba's 1563 itinerary um, prove especially key and continue throughout the many itineraries to follow. Um, they are republished with little to no variation until well into the 18th century, despite ample infrastructural shifts in that period. The exact wording of route headers such as, quote, from Rome to Naples by the road of Valmonte and the Algeria woods, um, which itself is published by five different authors in 21 different editions, makes coincidence unlikely. The digital approach also brings to light uh, certain one-to-one -one relationships. So for example, this work here, which is Richard Verstegen's 1576 itinerary, um, he writes in the letter that he drew from a combination of uh, German and French examples. Um, but in fact, I can say that he was more or less copying wholesale an earlier edition of this itinerary by Georg Meyer. The data set also allows for the exploration of individual titles across time, um, and it helps to demonstrate the fungibility of a term like edition when we're just going to write this material. So here I'm showing uh, four different simple Palladio maps of Ottavio Codogno's work. The 1608, um, 1616, and 1676 editions all share a title. They're published as the new itinerary. And then the 1623 version is actually a republication as the compendium of the posts. So one would assume that there's quite significant differences between the new itinerary and the compendium, but not necessarily among those editions of the new itinerary. You would assume wrong. So when we focus in on an area such as the south of France here, we can see that there's significant changes from one edition to the next, even past the lifetime of the author as Canonio himself dies in 1630. So this is publishers going in and making changes. In fact, even between the 1608 and 1616 editions, Codonio added at least 76 routes. Um, another example is a popular itinerary by Francisca Chodas, um, which had been published, was published over the course of nearly 150 years. Um, and it was still seeing substantial reworkings by the 1740s. Overall, the route corpus represents um, a proxy for this early modern common knowledge, especially as shared among a set of itinerant administrators and businessmen. While I'm presenting a vision here that's uh, not something many early modern actors had access to in its entirety, the model is nonetheless based upon this practice of incorporation, adaptation, and use that was common to the creators and users of the itineraries. So now I'll move on to talk about what that route canon actually is. An influential history of Europe's diplomatic courier states, if one thing is plain, it's that merchant and pilgrim routes were not those used by the post riders. 
However, by refocusing on the mental maps that were employed, published, and sold by postal professionals, among others, we see that pilgrimage and mercantile routes continue to exercise this conceptual power, even in the itineraries that were specifically postal in nature. To this end, I use betweenness and eigenvector centrality to illustrate which cities are important within the network by virtue not just of the quantity, but by the quality of their ties. Um, and I'll mention before showing these visualizations that two important filters are in effect. Um, first, because I'm most interested in what constituted this common canon, I've only kept edges, uh, edge types that appear in works by more than one creator. So for example, Rome to Milan, right? That edge type is repeated by many different editions. Um, and many different creators, I mean. Uh, I also only keep cities that appear then in more than a single edge type, so they have more than a minimum degree of two. So in this map, I'm showing the uh, ranked between the centrality. So the darkest points are those with the highest uh, scaled between the centrality. And the way that I've scaled it is by simply dividing it by degree, as otherwise the highest between the centrality would largely map onto the highest degree nodes. Um, we see points along the Italian, German, and Swiss roads, uh, which I treat in greater length than the dissertation and eventual book. Um, but for now, I'll draw your attention um, to this comparison uh, on the right, which is this path of St. James. So the path of St. James leads from many different parts of Europe, um, all aimed at Santiago de Compostela, located here in the northwest corner of Spain, where the shrine is located. Um, almost all scholarship on this pilgrimage of St. James treats it as a largely medieval phenomenon, but the itineraries demonstrate that it continued to structure European travel and communication well into the 17th century. So the, the significance of the betweenness centrality here is that this journey continues to serve as the essentially mnemonic organizing many other journeys. These connections are the building blocks of many of the routes featured within the itineraries, not just those that are labeled as the path of St. James. A return to close reading supports the importance of this path. In fact, the journey was often specially advertised on the cover or featured as the first journey in the book. Um, so here on the left, we have the example from Codonio, uh, which it begins its route tables with this journey. And then on the right, a much later example um, dating from the 1680s in Germany, which does the same thing. So we start to see that this is a core component of the itinerary as a genre. Overall, I think we can productively think of the indexing structure of the books as functioning like a modern search engine. It predicts the common uh, shape and content of its users' queries. So for that reason, eigenvector centrality is especially uh, appropriate. Um, in this case, I'm similarly representing the, uh, the scaled eigenvector centrality with the darkest points being those to have the, the highest uh, metric. In this case, I draw your attention to this comparison. So on the right, I'm showing a series of paths that are referred to colloquially as Das Romweg or the Roman Way. And these are a number of different pilgrimage paths that largely lead down from Central Europe into to Rome. Um, like the path of St. James, these inherited routes continue to play a structural role in the itineraries, linking many of the mercantile centers on either side of the Alps. Um, and in fact, if you were to look at a table of the cities with the highest scale eigenvector centrality, what would stand out is not those cities that are most populous or located in key geographic areas, other than those that are on others each side of the, the Alps. So a lot of relatively small cities such as St. Gallen actually have quite a high scaled eigenvector centrality. And that's because the, the authors were predicting that people would come to the books to basically look at how to reach these common gathering points and then go outwards from there. So having addressed some of these long-standing patterns in the itineraries, I'm now going to focus on some of the discontinuities in the data set, especially as it changes over time. <clears throat> so new routes in the itineraries often repeat the same edges, which means individual connections between cities. The most significant changes to routes broke edges or connected cities in completely different ways. Um, thus creating or removing edges of a dynamic network. 
I think of the routes as having a kind of lifetime as an idea as defined as its birth date being its appearance, its first appearance in a published itinerary and essentially dying by either no longer being republished or being so completely reworked that it's no longer identified as the same route. Here I'll briefly demonstrate the potential of the SNA and TSNA packages in our programming language for the creation and uh, time slicing of these network models. And I'll note that I'm quite indebted to Alex Bray's tutor tutorial as to how to do this um, available on the programming historian. Here I'm demonstrating two time slices of the dynamic network. And again, this is the totality of a common route corpus among the uh, 86 itineraries. Uh, by 1585, the core of the network represents many international connections weaving together European space. And I'll note uh, the somewhat tenuous connection between France and Spain, but they're nonetheless and located quite core to the overall network. By 1635, the edges that have been forged by the path of St. James persisted, but in an almost entirely separate axis, um, shown in this blue box. We see a key structure for organizing many different parts of the itineraries instead start to become almost vestigial, uh, with new infrastructures now providing the primary organizing logics. The separation of the access uh, indicates how these connections, which had once been somewhat buried in these other routes, uh, now remain as almost an entirely separate genre trope. Another way we can see shifts over time is to compare the internal structures of two different itinerary books. So here I'm showing Ottavio Codogno's itinerary on the left, and then one that's produced in a similar context in many ways on the right. This is Giovanni Vidari's 1720 itinerary, um, with Vidari also being a member of the Northern Italian Post, the Venetian rather than the Milanese, but my work has shown that these two are quite intertwined. A comparison of the two networks demonstrates enormous structural change in how the book itself is constructed. Um, itineraries are increasingly organized in terms of long roads rather than direct connections. So headers will now provide lists of four to five cities, sometimes even going as much as 10. So why this change? Well, in a letter to the reader, Vidari proves a crucial clue. Um, he describes having gathered French, German, and Italian sources, um, specifically itinerary books, comparing them against his experience, and then, quote, newly published cartographic maps. So this takes us to the question of how cartography impacted this earlier genre. In 1632, Nicolas Sanson publishes one of the first known uh, printed postal maps. And so this marks each of the postal stops along these roads, essentially. In fact, maps uh, affect a very different image and purpose than the itinerary books. Cartographers of the 17th century and beyond often received explicit patronage from the state or religious institutions. They produced maps for the explicit purpose of furthering and showcasing a largely domestic state infrastructure. Like their audiences, itinerary creators increasingly use these maps to structure their geographic knowledge. And I'll show you two examples of that here. Sometimes these maps serve a more decorative role like on this frontispiece, um, but oftentimes, especially starting from the uh, end of the 18th, 17th century into the 18th century, uh, itinerary creators are using these maps to abbreviate their printed instructions. They're actually telling readers, fold out this map and look at you know, whatever point for deciding how to get between point A to point B. The paratextual material of the itinerary books also evolved. So while these books had often featured things like the chapters about the origin of the post and Codonios, more commonly inserts describing the pilgrimage paths and uh, merchant tools for conversion especially. Now that they're um, by the 1680s and uh, thenceforth, they're increasingly featuring uh, state instituted timetables for things like the postal coaches or the tariffs of travel. So overall, I find that reading across the itineraries books demonstrates a collaborative transnational development of the itinerary as a genre. A canon of routes was inherited from the late Middle Ages and gradually shifted towards the national map more familiar to the modern reader. The itineraries also demonstrate a conceptual reorganization of European mental map. They demonstrate the impact of cartography as well as other uh, events.
And then finally, this last finding is one that I won't get into today, but I do much more so in the article, um, which is that the network approach demonstrates the long-term impact of national infrastructure. Um, and it also suggests important exceptions to the rule. So my particular interest is a period of intense connectivity, which immediately proceeds and continues during the Thirty Years' War. So with my remaining time, I'm going to briefly address uh, where I see going with this project from this point. And I'll only take about five minutes to do. I see I'm um, going a little bit over time. Um, so I mentioned the technical limitations of only working with the header data. Well, I've been working with research assistants at Stanford and here at Virginia Tech in order to uh, train models to extract more of that information, especially that rich content information in the list themselves. Um, so Transcribus has been key for this, and then I'll show you what this actually looks like for a given itinerary. What we've been doing is training a model that will help to identify the structure of the text, um, as well as actually be able to interpret the uh, sometimes quite messy uh, text within it. I'm now at the point of nearly completing a structured version of Ottavio Codogno's 1623 compendium, um, and then figuring out what to do next with that. Um, there's a lot of great information in here um, that's not just the actual locations, but even glosses describing, for example, where you could visit a reliquary or have a good night at an inn or get um, some experience some especially tasty local wine. Or alternatively, fall in a river, as couriers also frequently did. Um, even after accessing the text, I want to give you a sense of the difficulty that remains in utilizing this data. So on the left, we have um, precisely why this has been so complicated to date. This is uh, a great example of a poor quality scan. I'm not complaining, it's available in digitized form, which is amazing, but not something I can immediately use, uh, especially text recognition technology on. So you can see we have um, some of the previous page bleeding over, we have different text orientations, we have fracture of font, we have um, different symbols, um, occasionally uh, very difficult to distinguish. Um, and then even when I'm able to get that text, it requires this process of expert deduplication. Um, so I've provided some of the main variations that I tend to see in the work with modern matches. Um, oftentimes what you'll have is an, an Italian uh, itinerary creator transcribing a German name for a place that is now known by its Polish equivalent, for example. Um, so the next step will be this process of deduplication and in some cases mapping. My eventual goal is to apply for a grant for building a web tool to make this data set more easily accessible. And what I'm showing you here is a quite early prototype. This was from something like the second year of my work on the project, um, built in R Shiny. Um, and this is just an example from Octavio's itineraries where you would essentially choose a starting location, map the places that were reachable uh, within the route header data alone, um, and then compare the different editions. So for example, over here, we're seeing the 1623 edition uh, in green, the points that uh, were featured in 1608 but are no longer available in gray. And then it would be possible to apply, for example, a map layer or perhaps eventually some data from projects like the Abundus. Um, overall, however, this is just in the experimental phase and it's something that I look forward to getting your feedback on. And then of course, this work will continue to support my own research on these postal networks. Um, so here I'm showing you a map that's, again, just based from Codonio's itinerary data and includes all of that content information about what the postal way stations actually looked like uh, from one location to another. And in the book, I'll make the case that these are four of the major arteries of especially the early postal networks, um, which do also map onto some of these older pilgrimage paths. So with that, I'll wrap up and I look forward to hearing your feedback.